<laughs> they're literally talking about controlling so many aspects of your existence. I mean, Bill Gates is, of course, on board with this. He's working and financing technology that will literally have implantable microchips that will control if you could have children with an on and off what? button. Yes, look up Bill Gates microchips funding. They're all, they're all competing, first of all, to, like, inflate your sense of beauty. You're young, you're going to make mistakes, and that's to be expected. I do have an opinion on algorithms, and I do have an opinion on what it does do to young girls' self-esteem. And totally. I, I well, you do, have teenage daughters. Yes. Right? Yeah. I, I just think, I mean, and, and young girls are a point of focus be, uh, for why they're a point of focus more than young boys. I'm not entirely sure. I guess it has to do with their emotional makeup, and, and uh, there's higher risk of self-harm due to social media. And Jonathan Haidt talked about that in his book, The Coddling of the American Mind. Um, it's, it's very clear that it's very damaging. And right. I, my kids, uh, you know, my 13 year old does have like interactions with their friends and I do see how they bully each other and they get so angry and mad at each other. Um, it is a factor, but it's an, it's an algorithm issue, right? It's, it, there's multiple things here. So the first thing is, um, just to kind of set the stage a little bit, uh, I always use E.O. Wilson, the sociobiologist to, who, who uh, sort of defined what, what the problem statement for humanity is. He said the fundamental problem of humanity is we have paleolithic emotions and brains, like easy brains that are hackable for magicians. We have medieval institutions, you know, government that's not really good at seeing the latest tech, whether it was railroads or now social media or AI or deep fakes or whatever's coming next. And then we have godlike technology. So we have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, godlike technology. Mm. You combine that fact, that's the fundamental problem statement. How do we wield the power of gods without the love, prudence, and wisdom of gods? It's actually something that Daniel taught me. And um, then you add to that the race to the bottom of the brainstem for attention. What is their business model? Just to review the basics, everybody knows this now, but it's, it's engagement. It's like, how do I get that attention at all costs? Yeah. So algorithms is one piece of that, meaning um, when you're on a news feed, like, I don't want to just show you any news. I want to show you the most viral, engaging, like longest argumentative comment threads news, right? So that's like pointing a trillion dollar market cap AI at your brain saying, I'm going to show you the next perfect boogeyman for your nervous system. The thing that's going to make you upset, angry, whether it's masks, vaccines, Francis Haugen, whatever the thing is, it will just drive that over and over again and then repeat that thing. And that's one of the, the tools in the arsenal to get attention is that the algorithms. Another one is technology making design decisions. Like how do we inflate people's sense of uh, beautification filters? In fact, just recently, since we talked last time, um, I think it's a MIT Tech Review article showing that um, they're all com they're all competing, first of all, to like inflate your sense of beauty. So they're doing the, the I think you the did filters. this thing. The filters, yeah. right? People know this stuff. It's very obvious. But they're competing for who can give you a nicer filter, right? <laughs> and then now, instead of waiting for you to actually add one, TikTok was actually found to actually do like a 2%, like just bare beautification filter on the no filter mode. Because the thing is, once they do that, the other guys have to do it too. Oh. So I just want to name that all of this is taking place in this race to capture human attention, because if I don't do it, the other guy will. And then it's happening with design decisions, like the beautification filters and like the follow you. And if you follow me, I'll follow you back and the like button and mm -hmm. check, pulled, refresh, the, the dopamine stuff. That's all design. Then there's the algorithms, which is I'm pointing a, a thing at your brain to figure out what, how can I show you an infinite feed that just maximally enrages you? And we should talk about that because that thing drives polarization which breaks democracy, but that's a, that's a, we can get into that. Oh, Daniel, let's bring you in here. So how did you guys uh, meet and how did this uh, sort of dynamic duo come about? <laughs> yeah, I was working on studying kind of catastrophic risks writ large. You've had people on the show talking about risks associated with AI and with CRISPR and genetic engineering and with climate change and environmental issues, and escalation pathways to war and all these kinds of things. And, and I think it's a, pretty common question of like how long do we have on which of these and are we doing a good job of tending to them so that we get to solve the rest of them and then for me it was there were so many of them what was in common driving them are there any kind of like societal generator functions of all of the catastrophic risks that we can address with to make a more uh, resilient civilization writ large tristan was working on the social media issues and um when you had eric on he talked about the twin nuclei problem of atomic energy and kind of genetic engineering and basically saying these are extremely 
powerful technologies that we don't have the wisdom to steward that power well. Well, in addition to that is all things computation does, right? There's a few other major categories. And computation has the ability to, as, as you mentioned with Facebook, get to billions of people in a very, very short period of time compared to how quickly the railroads expanded or like any other can type TikTok of tech. Get to a billion people, a billion users, which they did yeah. in like a few years versus before that it took software companies like Microsoft even longer than that. Before that it took railroads even longer than that. So the power of this tech is you can compress the timeline. So you're getting, you know, a scale of a billion people, uh, you're impacting a billion people in deeper ways much faster, which means that if you're blind to something, if you don't know what you might be doing, the consequences show up faster than you can actually remediate them. It's, when we say exponential tech, we mean a number of things. We mean tech that makes more powerful versions of itself. So I can use computer chips to model how to make better computer chips, and then those better computer chips can recursively do that. We also mean exponential speed of impact, exponential scale of impact, exponentially more capital returns, exponentially uh, smaller numbers of people capable of achieving a scale of impact. And so when he's mentioning godlike powers and kind of medieval institutions, the speed at which our tech is having influences in the world, and not just first order influences, the obvious stuff, but the second and third order ones. Facebook isn't trying to polarize the population. It's an externality. It's a side effect of the thing they're trying to do, which is to optimize ad revenue. But the speed at which new technologies are having effects on the world and the total amount of consequence is way faster than regulation can keep up with. So, and, and, just regulation, that, and just by that alone, we should be skeptical of any government's ability to regulate something that's moving faster than it, faster than it can appraise of what the hell is even happening in the first place. So well, we not only have, that, you, you need someone who really understands the technology, and you're not going to get that from elected officials. You're going to need someone who's working on it and has a comprehensive understanding of how the stuff works, how it's engineered, wh where it goes. You're, I mean, I'm skeptical of the government being able to regulate almost everything. There's something weird that is happening when we are canceling things that are good and propping things up that are bad. And what I mean by this is, of course, amidst all of this back forth exchange with Cardi B, um, a lot of really important things got dropped about this conversation, about what it means uh, for women when somebody like Cardi B is named Women of the Year, uh, what it means for women when we're being told that less is more. It's not uh, less is less. I say all the time that it's, it's really hard being a girl. I get messages all the time from mothers who say to me, I don't know what to do with this society. You've got 13 year olds that are injecting their lips um, and thinking that they need to alter their bodies to be accepted. And it wasn't like this such a short time ago. A short time ago, Dr. Seuss was loved and we didn't consider Dr. Seuss books to be racist. A short time ago, a performance like the one that landed on the Grammys with um, Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion would have been roundly condemned by everybody. And the people that are getting lost um, at this time are young women who don't know what to do. Uh, when I was a kid, I was allowed to have braces when I was 13. We didn't have social media. I'm, I'm totally dating myself here. Uh, but we didn't have Twitter or Facebook. And so we were not uh, constantly being bombarded with images of women with their breasts out uh, and always looking for attention on the internet and things have drastically changed. And so I think it's incumbent upon women, women who care about young women to speak up and to speak out against this and to make sure that we are being uh, leaders in this society. One person that I have always adored uh, is Condoleezza Rice. I think she is a wonderful example of what it means to be successful, what it means to be powerful. And we don't see people like her uh, being propped up and being celebrated. So in order to make sure that I am a part of the change that I want to see be impacted in society. I did want to give three pieces of advice to young women who are struggling with this new culture. Uh, the first piece of advice would be to remind young women that thoughts become things. This is why you think it means nothing when you put on a dirty song on your on your iPad or on your phone and you say, OK, well, it's just music. It's not just music. Obviously, what you put in your ear informs your thoughts It informs your ideas um, about what you think the world should look like and what freedom is. Right. Uh, it is not freedom to wear less clothes. In fact, I would many ways would say that that's a form of slavery. If the only time you feel like you can be heard and the only time you feel like you can be seen is when you are stripping down, uh, you are basically selling your dignity and your self-respect. 
for a little bit of attention. And in my opinion, that's not a very good exchange. Uh, the second piece of advice I'd like to give you all is that morality is hard, uh, but it's more rewarding. And I say this as someone who I always say took the most liberal route to conservatism um, of any person ever. So you're young, you're going to make mistakes, and that's to be expected. But I also think that young girls need to know that uh, pick morality. It's hard in school when you're feeling all of the peer pressure, and especially when you have people on Instagram that are telling you that it's normal at 15, 16 to be getting Botox and lip injections. But if you choose morality at the end, uh, you will be rewarded for that. I can guarantee you that. And the last piece of advice, which I think has been really a big part of my brand as I consider myself to be the anti-feminist, if you will, um, is that modern feminism leads to unhappiness. I want you to take a look at all of the women right now that we hold up as idols in this society or that the media keeps telling you are your idols in society, the people that they say are so great, the celebrities that they say to worship. You know, they like to say, queen, everybody's a queen now. Uh, I stand for so-and-so. I stand for this person. I want you to ask yourself a very simple question. Do you think that that woman is happy? Look at her life. Do you think that that woman who is screaming into the Twitterverse is happy? Are they fulfilled? When you look around them, does it seem like they have what you would want? Uh, are they fulfilled in their relationships? Are they fulfilled with their family? Um, or are they looking for that sort of attention because they are unfulfilled? Um, I cannot think of a single person today that says, I'm a feminist, I'm a feminist, who I would want to exchange lives with, which is why um, I have dumped feminism, because it no longer is about equality. Uh, it is about really the opposite. And I think that in many ways, it brings us back to old, antiquated ideas of what it means to be a woman. Um, that actually, and quite ironically, favors the patriarchy, does not destroy